afterwards, what we found out is that Mike Pompeo then, um, following on through from this speech where he targeted WikiLeaks uh, and Julian, then had conversations with, in the White House, discussed uh, the possibility of assassinating Julian, even asked his agency to draw what were called sketches and options of how to do that. And, and then obviously drive a propaganda campaign that was really intense in 2018, leading up to Julian's arrest. So that was the background and the CIA had infiltrated the embassy by contracting without Ecuador's knowledge, the security company that was working inside. So they had security guards there 24 seven and those security guards were instructed, were receiving instructions from the U.S. agency via a third party who was, uh, the third party was Las Vegas Sands. Las Vegas Sands was owned by Trump's the largest financial backer, Sheldon Adelson. Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy, and this is the Locked Up Living podcast, where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, six o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. Today, we're really pleased to welcome along Stella Assange. Stella is a human rights lawyer who was born in South Africa, and she's the wife of Julian Assange, who's a founder of WikiLeaks and a prisoner at HMP Belmarsh. And Stella and Julian have two children. Really pleased that you could join us today, Stella. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Hi, Stella. Very nice to meet you. And thanks very much indeed for giving us your time. Of course. So, Stella, you joined Julian's legal team in 2011. How did you come to be part of his legal team? By chance, really. I had a contact with someone who was already on his legal team, Jennifer Robinson, and she sent an email out and I was invited to an interview. Um, and so I came to London for the interview in February 2011. And that's when I first met Julian and joined his legal team um, shortly after. Thank you. So what's your background? Where did you come from? I, I was born in South Africa, as you said, and I grew up in Lesotho and Botswana until I was eight. And then I moved to Europe. We moved to Sweden initially and then moved to Spain because my parents moved to Spain. And I finished my schooling in Spain and then I came to London for university. I moved to London in 2002 and, and studied law and politics. And then I went to work for a while in Botswana and East Timor and studied in Oxford after that. And then eventually ended up back in London, um, joining Lim's legal team. And I think I had been following what WikiLeaks had been publishing for a while, but not in detail. I, I didn't seek it out, but I was very interested in what was happening. And that might have to do with my, with my personal background, because my parents were involved in the struggle against apartheid when we were in Southern Africa. And that was my upbringing. It was quite political. It was that uh, we were surrounded by other people who were committed and engaged with issues of injustice and fighting for freedom and fairness and so on. And so I wouldn't say that I was a an activist in that sense, but it was definitely my, my sense of the need to fight injustice was definitely something that was already, that I was always already carrying with me. And yeah, that's probably one of the reasons why I took an interest also in, in 
WikiLeaks itself because it provided a whole new framework for that kind of work to fight injustice. So that's, yeah, that's more or less what got me there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that's, it's really interesting to hear about that kind of background and those influences on, on, on your life. But moving on, as than most people, I should think, one of the strategies that's commonly used against whistleblowers is the tactic of discrediting the person who's been speaking out truthfully. And sure. Julian has been portrayed in the media as a reckless hacker, a rapist, and a narcissist. What's he really? Well, he's the exact opposite of all those things. That's how you, that's how you attack a person's character. You invert all the things that are um, virtuous about them and say that they're exact, the exact opposite to try to distract and undermine any support that they'll get and so on. Yeah, Julian is the most principled man I know. He's very consent conscientious. He thinks about the good of humanity in a kind of big picture way, in a way that I haven't met anyone else that thinks in leading terms, in terms of um, the long arc of history and of, for example, the layers of injustice when when for example a civilian killing has been has occurred not only has no one help been held accountable but the very fact of the killing is covered up and concealed and that just adds so many layers of injustice and so Julian's also a, a very kind of action oriented person. He doesn't just think about problems, but he thinks, how could this be solved? What could we do about it? And, and then he tries to do something about it. So I think if you truly understand what, how WikiLeaks is built and read all the, the descriptions about it, I wonder if it's worth just saying at this moment, David, for the listeners, that actually the film Hacking Justice is quite an interesting film to watch because there is so much footage of Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy. So it does give you the opportunity to get a glimpse of him just in his ordinary, everyday yeah. interactions. I think it's very easy to fall for media accounts of him being arrogant, but actually I think when you watch the footage, it's quite easy to see that's not how he appears to conduct himself during ordinary everyday moments. Yes. Yeah. Look, the embassy, it sounds very grand, but it, what, what it was a, a, an apartment in a block of apartments in, in Knightsbridge. And it wasn't the whole floor, but rather half, half of the floor had some about seven or eight rooms and a, a meeting room and practically i mean you get a very good idea of the of the layout of the place if you see the footage from inside the embassy you came through the door there was a reception area with the security guards everyone had to be pre-booked in order to see julian days in advance and the meetings took place in the meeting room and and the rest were offices, and Julian had about one and a half rooms and a and a tiny room for a bed in the back, and that was it. And during this period in the embassy, the the circumstances were very different depending on who was president and and so on. So in the beginning, it was a very interesting environment because. Uh, because there was full support from Ecuador. And so conferences were held there and Julian was able to do interviews on any time zone. He could have his crew set up or the TV channels come and set up in the middle of the night. 
and receptions and so on. And I think at the time, the government, the previous government of the Korea administration, they understood Julian's, how Julian was a point of interest and attraction for a lot of interesting people. And, and so they, they were fully supportive of there being conferences and so on held from the embassy and hosted by Ecuador and so on. And then over time, it became very restrictive. It, over time, it became virtually indistinguishable from a prison. And of course, it is very interesting to think about how a space like that can become a prison. I think it's maybe similar to extreme forms of domestic abuse where the the, the space is controlled effectively by someone who has power over you and who can dictate all the, each detail of how you exist in that space. And so it became very arbitrary. So for example, and this is after the change of administration around 2017 and increasingly in 2018, um, up until Julian's arrest in 2019. So there was a, a progression over about a year and a half or something like that, where things were getting progressively worse and worse. And one of the characteristics of, of this process was how arbitrary it became, that there were, all of a sudden, there was a new rule. And it was a new rule that was communicated verbally, and it wasn't ver communicated when it was set, but when it was violated. And so we would say, can we have a list of these new rules? Because yesterday it was different. <laughs> and they wouldn't give us a list. And then eventually, around March 18, the Ecuadorian government from one day to the next decided that Julian was to receive no visitors, that he would have no contact with the outside world through either in the internet or phone contact. And that involved installing signal jammers, basically a machine that, that jams all signals, it involves Wi-Fi and, and phone. And of course, this knocked out not only the signals inside the embassy, but also affected the other apartments. Um, and that was to actively prevent Julian from his ability to communicate. Those of us who were still allowed to come in had to leave to make phone calls or leave to try to get internet connection or whatever. And, and that, those, that blocking of the internet and his phones and his visitors as well, he wasn't allowed to receive any visitors from the 28th of March, 2018 on. And it was a whole year before his arrest. So just so you see the progression. And then his, his uh, Spanish team, uh, Baltazar Garzon and Aitor Martinez managed to basically compel this, the Ecuadorian government to, or the embassy to set out the rules. And so what they had was a, a long document of, I forget how many rules, it was something like 30 rules. Um, and implicit in that was not implicit, it was explicit that should any of these rules be violated, his, his political asylum would be withdrawn. And that's just a, an insane type of coercion, especially when many of these rules were completely unreasonable and extreme. Like for example, Julian was to give the Ecuadorian uh, embassy all his electronics, including their registration numbers, any visitors that he was allowed, that came in, were also had to do that, including their social media accounts. And if any of his visitors who came in from the outside violated any of these rules, um, then Julian would be thrown out as well. And there was no, there was no process around it and it was from tiny rules to to really impossible to 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 meet 
conditions. But it was just basically they put down in writing how very arbitrary and it all was. And the way it was explained to me by by one of the diplomats who acknowledged exactly what was going on was that this this document was a banana peel for Julian to slip on. And um and it wasn't signed. So when you get that kind of extraordinary document, no one wants to put their name to it because everyone knows it's just a an embarrassment. Um it 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 sounds as if he was being poor Stella Stella. And uh, I think you've given a very powerful description there of the process of a culture changing, uh, the introduction of the invisible rule, and there were probably a number of them as yes. well, which then eventually, the invisible rule, that is a culture around you shifting, and suddenly you found that things that were okay yesterday are no longer legitimate. That's certainly an experience that I've had. But you're also describing how these become hardened into this kind of list of rules, which again, nobody takes any responsibility for. How, yes. how, did, how did all this affect Julian? Oh, uh, this kind of harassment affects any person with a sense of self or it affects your relationship with the outside world because it's not, even if you're the, the strongest, most resilient person who can put everything in perspective and understand why, understand the reason behind it, as in he's being smeared in the media because um, because the US government wants to shut WikiLeaks down and so they have incentives to get people to write things by holding briefings spinning things, issuing their own press releases that distort reality, an extended work network of of journalists and other people in, in the communications world who can be elevated by as a reward for writing articles of a certain type. And that's, for example, by being invited to certain conferences and invited into certain networks and so on. And you can understand all of, so I think with the smears, Julian and everyone who, who was living through this and witnessing it, um, understood these things with a level of sophistication and distance. Um, and it was disappointing, but you also understand how you understand the process, as in some people are just working as journalists and then they're incentivized to report a certain way by their editors or others, and then they get invited to conferences and then they... Anyway, all of these things you can explain, um, but that's a way of processing why lies are being told about you and so on. But then everyone else is also exposed to those lies and they don't necessarily understand where it's coming from or how distorted it is or anything else. And then your relationship with them changes. So I think that's the more difficult side of it. It's not so much what is printed or but it affects everyone else who's also exposed to it and their relationship with you. So I think that's obviously one aspect that that is very challenging. I think it's quite isolating because um, in that kind of, when that kind of thing happens, then you find that very few people really can understand the whole dynamic um, and don't, aren't affected by it or... Um, or understand how it's happened and how to counter it and so on. So for, for Julian, I think he's, he's has a lot of experience. He definitely knew that he would be a lightning rod for all sorts of attacks, um, on his reputation, legal, financial, etc. And he's, he's a 
very resilient person who's who can, I think, can deal with that kind of thing in a very, in a much better way than the average person might be. But of course, still, it it affects him as it affects any person, and especially. especially when it affects other people and their perception of what's going on and of you and so on. That's, I think, the, the kind of sadder aspect to it. It, it. I'm thinking, Sarah, it must be totally frustrating when your whole drive is to get the truth out there, to find yourself in a position where it's impossible to get even the modicum of truth heard by, by others. I find it frustrating enough just reading the newspapers about Israel and Palestine. Anyway, I should probably move on. It reminded me of working in prisons, actually, and the fact that as a staff member, you'd often be on the receiving end of a, a lot of aggression and hatred. And you could rationally, you could understand and make sense of why you were on the receiving end of that. But actually, it doesn't necessarily make it less painful to experience. There's still a degree of hurt that comes with that. and and having to brace yourself at times for hostility is not is not something that's good for human beings, is it? If you're having to live in that state for a long time. Yeah, I think that's right. And also, as a human being, you fight with your status as a victim of something that shouldn't be happening to you. <laughs> yeah, I think you, on the other hand, I think, with Julian and the press and so on, he, while he wasn't in prison and silenced with things like the internet being shut off and so on, he was able to fight back. So he was able to denounce and counter and so on. It's quite different now and for the past five or so years where he hasn't been able to speak for himself and has been reliant on others doing it for him and with not quite as big an impact or as big a, a megaphone. So I think that's tough. But in, in Julian's case, I do think that the degree of understanding around what has actually happened to him, what's been done to him and so on, has increased over time. If it had been the opposite, that there had been less interest, less understanding and so on, I think it would be completely intolerable because that, that was the, that's what was attempted and has failed is to completely delete his legacy and his motivations and, um, and replace them with, with all the attacks. I don't, I'm certain that has been a, a complete failure, but if they had succeeded, then it would be completely unbearable for him or for anyone after, after doing all that, everything that he's done and to see that completely destroyed and forgotten, I don't think anyone would survive that mentally. At least it looks as if, and it sounds as if life living in the embassy was very difficult at all times, but certainly you can hear that things got much worse when there was a change of regime. The benefit of listeners, why didn't Julian just leave at that point where his communications were shut down and he was having this list of long list of rules imposed on him? At the time, this was during the Trump presidency and... um the director of the CIA, Mike Pompeo, had, had done a speech in April, begin, beginning of April, so it was all happening around that time, 2018, in which uh, he said that the CIA was basically going to take WikiLeaks down. And his maiden speech was all about Julian. And when you think about it, it's actually, this might have been March might have been before he was shut off uh, the internet and so on. It's quite extraordinary that the head of the, the Central Intelligence Agency, the agency that's involved in, in, in not just foreign intelligence gathering, but foreign counterintelligence in, involved in 
operations to to further their interests abroad and so on, including through assassinations and propaganda and so on. So the head of this agency um, held his maiden speech and made it all about Julian. And this was partly because WikiLeaks had just published the biggest leak in CIA history called Vault 7. And partly because Julian had just published an article, a comment piece in the Washington Post, where he explained that WikiLeaks was a was a, a publisher that was um, basically incarnating the highest principles of the U.S. Constitution, citing figures of U.S. politics and so on, and relating the method and purpose of WikiLeaks to those principles. And this really got Mike Pompeo's goat. And so he made this speech and uh, and then um, Julian wrote a set, second article in the Washington Post. Afterwards, what we found out is that Mike Pompeo then, um, following on through from this speech where he targeted WikiLeaks uh, and Julian, then had conversations with, in the White House, discussed uh, the possibility of assassinating Julian, even asked his agency to draw up what we called sketches and options of how to do that. And, and then obviously drive a propaganda campaign that was really intense in 2018, leading up to Julian's arrest. So that was the background and the CIA had infiltrated the embassy by contracting without Ecuador's knowledge the security company that was working inside. So they had security guards there 24-7. And those security guards were instructed, were receiving instructions from the U.S. agency via a third party who was... Uh, the third party was Las Vegas Sands. Las Vegas Sands was owned by Trump's largest financial backer, Sheldon Adelson. And... But there were very close ties. The head of security of Las Vegas Sands had been in the U.S., high up in the U.S. intelligence and so on. And so that was going on. And then inside the embassy, we were also getting, we also grew to understand that something very dangerous was happening inside the embassy and that the security company was receiving these strange instructions. We didn't know it at the time. They were recording Julian's meetings with his lawyers. They had hidden my microphones around the embassy. But for example, there was a microphone right next to the meeting table under a fire extinguisher. And then these recordings would be offloaded, placed into, offloaded onto a hard drives and then physically transported to the United States and then handed over to their handlers and so on. And the security guards who worked there when Julian was arrested, several of them then blew the whistle on what they had been doing. They didn't have the big picture of what was happening with Pompeo and so on, but they knew they were receiving instructions. They knew they were working for the Americans, as they called it, that they were, that they had gone over to the dark sides. This is also the terms they used inside the security company. And, and they had also been instructed, for example, to get the DNA of our six-month-old baby and the climate inside the embassy was extremely sinister but outside was even worse because because the director of the CIA the agency that kills people abroad had said that the CIA was going to take WikiLeaks out and so on of course we didn't know at the time that the CIA was inside the embassy too and at the same time Julian had so there was an outstanding arrest warrant in the UK, there was a the extradition case to Sweden that had previously been underway was dropped in 2017. So there was no no extradition case to Sweden. So there was a there was this strange situation where um, the underlying case where there there was actually no case because Julian was never charged in Sweden, but there was an extradition 
order for a while and then it was dropped because Sweden dropped the case. But there was this outstanding arrest warrant because Julian had failed to surrender to be extradited to Sweden initially. And he did try to get this arrest warrant dropped in in December 20. He went to the magistrate's court and said, there's either charge me for this bail violation or drop it or drop the warrant. Because if he if they charged him, then he would at least be able to defend himself. But no, it just hung over him. And what we didn't know at the time, but the court did know, was that the U.S. had already issued a preliminary sealed international arrest warrant slash extradition, uh, well, prospective extradition request. The court was certainly aware that the U.S. wanted Julian. And then there was a charade on in terms of public messaging that Julian was hiding from an arrest over bail. But of course, in the background, the U.S. had already requested him. The CIA was plotting to kill him and so on. Yes, it was a very, it's a complex context um, that um, you have to be following things very closely. And even we didn't really understand the true picture, but we had very strong indications of what that might be. And Ecuador, well, Ecuador tried to get him to leave the embassy by uh, giving him citizenship so in, and then diplomatic status. So in Ecuador, if you live in the country for five years or in the jurisdiction, then you're entitled to Ecuadorian nationality. So he got Ecuadorian nationality. And once you're a national, there can be a political appointment to a diplomatic position, which is what Ecuador then proceeded to do. They appointed him a, a political, it was a, a diplomatic post at the embassy. In the protocol is that, and it's actually in the Vienna convention, convention, that when you appoint an ambassador, the receiving country has to approve that person. Uh, but when you appoint other officers of the embassy, the receiving state doesn't approve them. They're just appointed. So Julian was just appointed and the foreign office was notified that Julian was now posted to the UK as an Ecuadorian diplomatic officer. And the foreign office went out of its way to say they didn't approve the appointment and would not recognize him as a diplomat. So there you had a moment where legally everything was correct. Julian had diplomatic immunity. He had the right to leave the embassy and not be arrested and, and yeah, go to a, a safe place. I think at the time it was France or, um, and, but because the foreign office didn't approve, then that was not a viable solution, even if it was completely above board. So yeah, yeah it was a very difficult situation for him to know that, that he had the right to leave, but that the UK authorities weren't going to let it happen. All sounds total utter nightmare and also so fantastical um, that in the sense that it's, it's the sort of stuff that movies are made of, isn't it? The state wanting, plotting to assassinate people. And yet there were senators openly talking on TV about this wish as well, weren't there? What, yeah. what, what was it like for you and him to cope with this level of, of hatred and danger? And you mentioned your child's being brought into that in terms of them trying to get your child's DNA. What was it like for you as a family having to cope with that? It, at times it was very stressful. And I think after we were told about the DNA instruction, then we decided that it's better for our little one not to come into the embassy and uh when i was pregnant the second time i just stopped going into the embassy and would keep in touch with julian remotely throughout the day and so on but yeah it just became too too oppressive and too volatile because we had no control over the, over that situation.
On the other hand, this is a situation that developed over a number of years and you learn to cope with a little bit and then a little bit more, like where are the cameras, is this guard listening in you, within that contained environment in the embassy, we had a fairly uh, a good idea of where the threat was in terms of our physical environment. And then I think in terms of hostility on the internet and so on, I it's a different order of hostility, right? One thing is when you're in the same space as people who are literally <laughs> not up to no good. <laughs> and then it's quite different when you're receiving abuse or something like that over the internet, which is nasty. It's not quite the same. And uh, I think for our, it brings people together as well, right? And... It, I think it is this kind of the the day to day and then the incremental the short in, things go incrementally of course when I talk about all of this um, you have to understand that this kind of thing had been building over some time and when WikiLeaks published for example the CIA thing then it was clear that the this agency was not going to be happy about it uh, I don't think anyone expected Mike Pompeo to to write a whole speech about WikiLeaks, but I guess it was always a, within the realm of possibility that they might try to kill Julian. But um, sometimes it's better not to know the full extent of what's going on because it, it would be too much. No, it can't be good for the physical or mental health for either of you. Yeah, I think, I think you, uh, at least I've come to understand that on some level you're, you're confronted with basically psychopathic behavior and you see this also on online. You see some responses you get, of course, nowadays, you don't even know if you're, if it's a machine or if it's a person, but, but there are these kind of psychopathic behaviors that are inter interacting with your life and your presence and then um that's quite nasty because it's unpredictable and and you don't really know how far it's going to go but then on the other hand there's also um julian has some fantastic friends who have who are admirable in their own rights and who respect julian and so it's not all just negative Obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot of good around around Julian. A lot of good people have who have shown their support for him, and he's and I have that very valuable friendships have come out of it as well. And some of them have been through kind of comparable situa situations in completely different contexts, of course, but. Very good to hear that, sir. Actually, yes, though, although it hasn't ended yet, has it? Naomi referred earlier to this all being a horror story, and indeed it is. And it's chilling to hear the way you're talking, really, because it's clear that there's a group of people who regard Julian as the enemy of the state. There are a number of them. Uh, who conflate their own personal wishes and desires and opinions with that of a, a very powerful nation state. And that's horrifying, really. But just, I'm aware of the time. So Julian moved from the embassy to Belmarsh prison, which of course is a high security prison. It's bizarre to think of a journalist being locked up in a high security prison. And he's, as I understand it, in solitary confinement there. Is that through his choice or, or what? Uh, it depends on the day. It's not through his choice. He's in a single cell. And 
it's a standard sized single cell in Belmarsh. And Belmarsh, I'm not familiar with how it is in other prisons, but it has a it has some characteristics. Uh, I think the time in cell is particularly bad, but not unique to Belmarsh, where due to whatever, probably understaffing, underfunding, or a routine that has evolved out of those situations, the way to deal with the prisoners is to leave them in their cell for as long as possible so that, so that they don't mingle too much and they don't get in fights and they don't this and they don't that. It's a way of controlling the prisoner population is to keep them isolated in their cells. Julian eats in his cell. He goes out to go to the yard for up to an hour a day. It's usually less. He leaves the cell to, to collect medication. I think the food nowadays is brought to the cell uh, before he would go and collect his food, but eat it in the cell. And that's not his choice. That's just the way it is. And during the period that he was in healthcare, the healthcare section at Belmarsh uh, was extreme. He was under more intense supervision, surveillance, or whatever, because he was considered a, a severe suicide risk. And of course, the people that you interact with in healthcare are people who are themselves in a very poor mental or physical state. So it's very, it's a very harsh environment. Obviously, when he has visits, then he's put in holding rooms and so on and spends less time in cell, but also in, in cells on his way to, to the visiting hall. But I think what he's, his situation in Belmarsh is still very significantly better than what he would face in the United States because he is able to call me throughout the day and some other contacts that have been approved by the prison. And that is a really important line of communication that, that keeps him connected with, not just with me, but with the outside world through me and able to speak to the children regularly. And the conversations actually are cut off every 10 minutes. So it's very frustrating and unnecessary. Why would you do that? And then he has to wait certain amount of time before you can call back so it becomes really disruptive to, to your communication to have to call speak only 10 minutes at a time but it's much better than the alternative so you end up being appreciating even this these phone calls which are even though they're 10 minutes at a time you feel like almost fortunate that you have that Belmarsh has given you the grace to speak to your husband 10 minutes at a time at certain times of day. It's quite, I think it's quite disturbing when I think about it, about how the, the smallest uh, concessions feel like a great gift because it shouldn't be their gift to give. This should, we should be able to, First of all, you shouldn't be in prison, but we shouldn't have our communications restricted by some arbitrary rules on 10 minutes on and then no call. And then especially what seems quite bizarre, both David and I have worked in prisons for a long time and I've never heard that rule applying in other cases. So I think it's one of these things where probably when they introduced the system, there was maybe a technical reason why. Because of course, all the phone calls are recorded. So maybe at the time it was necessary to record that 10 minutes and maybe get. Did they have prisoners on category A who have their phone calls recorded and their phone calls don't last for 10 minutes? Because that's a bone of contention for prisoners is when they're waiting to get on the phone after right. to somebody else. I, that, yeah, I can't understand it. And that's, that sounds like special conditions imposed. Yeah, because special for Belmarsh. They can call several times throughout the day, but it's only 10 minutes at a time. And 10 minutes is like 
when you're 10 minutes into a conversation, you're really into the conversation, then it just cuts off. Yeah, and it's, it's, yeah. Must be so frustrating. Stella, I'm conscious of the time because I know you've got another appointment immediately afterwards, but just before you go, I wanted to ask if people want to support Julian, what's the best way that they can provide support to him? There's a website called don'textraditeassange.com and it has an action page with various actions. Obviously, people can donate if they're in a position to do to Julian's legal expenses and also to the campaign. There, The links are on that page. There's also something that we call the Free Assange Emergency Toolkit, and that will also have details of immediate actions. and. On the day of Julian's public hearing, we're calling it day X for now because we don't have a public hearing date yet. We're waiting for the court to announce it. We're asking everyone who can to please, please come to the Royal Courts of Justice on the day and show support for Julian. It's really important because there will be a lot of attention on the case uh, on that day. There will be a lot of press there. There will be photographers and cameras and it's really important that they see that Julian has a lot of support from regular people who are deeply disturbed by by what's being done to him and that um and that he should never be extradited to the United States and he has to be free thank you so much for coming on and sharing uh, yours and Julian's story with us and that I just really hope that you get some kind of positive resolution in the near future. It's, you know, it's absolutely awful to, to contemplate. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much indeed. That was uh, really powerful. And the story you've told us there today. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys.